Hello and welcome to the Grand Touring Motorsports Podcast, Break, Fix, where we're always fixing the break into something motorsports related. Our guest tonight began his career in the automotive industry in the early 1960s, when he started importing small cars from Europe and Japan to sell in the United States. In 1968, he founded Subaru of America and helped introduce the Subaru 360 to the American market. In the 1970s, Malcolm Bricklin turned his attention to creating his own sports car, the Bricklin SV1. The car featured gullwing doors and a fiberglass body and was powered by a V8 engine. 2,854 units were sold before production ceased in 1975. Today, Malcolm remains an active and influential figure in the automotive industry, continuing to explore new ideas and business ventures in the pursuit of his entrepreneurial vision. And he's here tonight to explain to us just exactly what he's been up to. Thanks, Don. And with that, picking up where we left off in part one, welcome back, Malcolm. Thank you. We were somewhere in the middle of the late 1990s. You were talking about Lee Iacocca, electric bicycles, all sorts of stuff like that, kind of leading up to the founding of Visionary Vehicles. Talk us through this. How and why did you start another car company? Well, this time I went around the world looking for a car company that would do exactly like I told them. I would buy 100% of their production with letters of credit, and their job was only to do what I told them, meaning go to Pinafrina and Bertoni for design, go to AVL for their engines, and let me approve the design that we're willing to buy. So I was going to find a factory that was going to do everything I want, and for that, they were going to have no responsibility. They would build a good quality car, and I was going to pay for it letters of credit. I went all over the world, and one of my sons, who was a filmmaker, lived with me for four years. He went everywhere I went and filmed every meeting I had during those four years. And we had a group that edited in the company, and we sent out what I was doing to the potential dealers until we found China. And I found somebody at Cherry who said, I love it. Now, a little history of Cherry. When we got there, they had a brand new factory, but they had built their factory without asking the central government for a permit. They got away with it because there were people in the province who were part of the government, old timers, and they had a lot of respect. So they sort of got away with it. Sort of got away means they were punished. They had to give 20% of their stock to SAIC. SAIC was a definite owned by the government. And I had Volkswagen and General Motors as two of their partners. And they had to get 20% of the stock. And the company was called SAIC Cherry. That was their penalty. We came there. We made a deal. The deal had two parts in it. We were redefining the price of luxury. We were going to build a car that looks like, feels like, and was a $35,000 car. But we were going to sell it for twenty to 25000 Everybody was going to make money on it instead of a cheap Chinese car. Listen, a beautiful design doesn't cost you one penny more than an ugly design. It's just not the way they sell cars. Vanilla is under 30, and it goes up a little bit better as it goes up in price. We said, to hell with that. We're going to give you a great coming in. Everything, no excuse. They loved it. They loved it so much that when we did our publicity in China, the central government loved that so much that SAIC gave back their 20%. It was now just called Cherry. And Mr. Yin won Man of the Year. We have him on film saying, oh my God, it was Mr. Bricklin who did this. We went from the bastard tile to the favorite son of uh, uh, and bragged and bragged and bragged. We brought our dealers to China in groups. They met with the people. They talked with the people. They saw the factory. They saw what we were building. They already had put in the AVL factory for the uh, building of the engines. They were doing everything we said. One of the paragraphs that was in the contract that delayed us by about two months because I refused to change a word, and they were having a problem putting it in, like I said, and it said the following. This paragraph is non-negotiable. It cannot be changed. It is part of our total understanding that you do not ask visionary vehicles to invest in a factory in China. I am in the import business. I am in selling cars, designing cars. I am not in building cars. They got it, all right? Fast forward. We are now going out and talking to dealers. And in order to get a territory, a nice sized territory, they had to buy $2 million worth of stock in our company. At a $3 billion valuation, what we had was a contract period that you could verify by going to China with us. We had $157 million in escrow in the bank. 
when I got notified by Cherry, they wanted $200 million for a factory in China. I told them, read the paragraph. They said, we've never read it. We're not doing anything. We're just not going to do anything until you give it to us. We're not breaking any contracts. I said, you understand the reason? If I have to raise $200 million outside of the dealer's money, I have to give away control. There is no way in God's earth I am going to stay when somebody who knows less than me is in charge because they put up the money. That's the price you're going to pay. And believe me, that's a serious price because it's not going to be a success. That simple. No, they want their $200 million. So I said, okay. And the first person that agreed to give me my $200 million was George Soros. Oh, my goodness. Not my favorite person. I was a little nervous taking his $200 million. But they put it in uh, escrow. They wanted 60 days to do due diligence. We agreed. And then we were all going to meet in Hong Kong when that was over. And each one of us would either say we're going forward or we're not. And so we met after 60 days in Hong Kong. And everybody said we're moving forward. Everybody was excited except me. Friday, Saturday, Sunday comes Monday. I am in Soros's office in New York to talk about what they would like to do next before the money goes live. And Jonathan Soros, son of, comes out with his little troop and says, uh, we decided not to go forward. Now, that was four days before they had met in Hong Kong and said, we're going forward. I said, would you mind telling me what happened? No. Okay. And they said, oh, and we're leaving the money in escrow. When you replace it, we'll take it out. Now, that was pretty scary because George Soros and I are not buddies. That's number one. And that's his not normal style of doing business. If he's finished, he's finished. Give me my money and I'll see you later. For him to leave it in there made me extremely nervous. Something, of course, happened, except that we don't know what it is. We finally found out under deposition when we sued everybody, which was my second dumbest move, even though we won everywhere. That money went to attorneys and went to expenses for a 10-year suit in every country known to man. But remember, we had films on every single meeting we had. There was no argument. There was no defense. We said you did it, and here's you saying it. End of story. All right. What we had to do is go through all the baloney that lawyers make over a period of years that just cost money. We found out that they had made a deal with Cherry. Brooklyn doesn't get the money. You know, we'll take over. All right. So now I have to find another $200 million. So I get introduced to the Offer Brothers. Offer Brothers, richest family in Israel. If not the number one, number two. Daddy came there when they were in Israel just starting and got the license for everything, for oil, for shipping, for you name it. And the geniuses made a lot of money by having a monopoly on everything. And they were not well liked in Israel. That being said, they send in an ex-executive vice president of Volkswagen who had a a very bland career. Nothing good, nothing bad. Just he was there. And he came in to do his due diligence for them. And we filmed everything, of course. And we made them sign everything, of course. Oh, don't worry. These are honorable people. I said, we don't care. You're going to sign everything. You're going to say everything on film. Under no circumstance, when we introduce you, no matter what the excuse is, if we don't do business, you don't do business with them for five years. Selling Mickey Mouse watches, you don't do business with them. Oh, no problem. No problem. Okay. No problem. So now we fast forward. They do their due diligence. Everybody's happy. They're all excited about it. Now that the Alpha Brothers are going to fly in on their airplane to China, and we're going to have the big meeting with the executives of Cherry. Or for some reason, in my 65 years in the car business, this is the only time I said to myself, don't be at that meeting. Wow. That is an impossible scenario for me not to be at the much less important meetings. To be like that, that's not even a consideration normally. But my gut said, don't be there. So I had my vice chairman, who was a shipping magnet, who arranged all our shipping, who was an investor in the company who they loved because of the shipping and his knowledge. And he went, and about four other of our staff went, top guys. And in the meeting, the offers said to the jury, why do we have to deal with the brickle? Why don't we just go to the brickle? They said, yeah. And my guy gets up going, what are you, out of your mind? We spent $30 million. We have all this. You're out of your mind. Blah, 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 blah. You know you can't break the car. Blah, blah. And he says to him, come with me. And he takes him there. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of you. Now, his choices were, do I lose my money because they're going to fuck us? Or do I not lose my money and find a way to clutch him? So he chose the calm down, which I think was a smart thing for him to do. There's nothing more he could have done no matter what. 
And they started offering us all sorts of deals, which were just totally stupid. That was the end of it. And then after about six months, I decided I couldn't take it any longer. I had a suit everywhere, in Hong Kong, in uh, Detroit, uh, you name it. And what I found was the justice system in this world truly sucks. Truly, truly sucks. I was once told something by a very wise man when I was much younger. He said, Malcolm, if you're in the right, don't sue. You could lose. But if you're not, go ahead and sue. You might win. And that's basically where the justice system is. We sued the Israelis in New York because that's where we held all our meetings and that's where our offices were. And we had all the film to prove it. And we got venue in New York. They had the most expensive lawyers in New York City. And for a year, we passed back and forth papers that the judge asked for, that they asked for, that we asked for, and we had venue. We were waiting for about a week or two, and we were going to have our jury trial started, and we were going to just win billions, not maybe positively, or at least hundreds of millions. We really lost a fortune proven by the dealers that signed up already and what they were going to order and what that meant in profit. Two weeks before we're ready to go to court, we get an announcement that the other side, the Offer Brothers, have added another law firm to their law firms. They didn't get rid of the older one. They added. This particular law firm was a one-man law firm. That one-man law firm took the judge out for lunch, and the next day we lost venue. That's impossible. That's impossible. That's an outright, no question, bribe or threat of some kind. And that was the end of it. We couldn't sue anywhere in the United States because of that judge's ruling after one year having venue and it being ready for a court case. What a surprise. You were probably winning and the other side couldn't stand that, so they played dirty pool. Oh, no, of course, nobody ever fought us. There was no such thing as we were losing. How could we? We said they did this, and we showed them the film. There they are doing it. Right. Here's what they said. Right. Here's the film doing it. Here's what we said. Here's the film doing it. But those guys couldn't stand losing. It was a cut and dry. There was never any argument on the other side. So now you find yourself in the early 2000s with the name of a company, but no car. So where do you go from here? Visionary Vehicles was a company that was going to do what I had already done five times before, but this time not find a car that they were building, find a company that would build the car I want them to build. That was a major difference. And it took me four years to find this company. I went everywhere. I talked to everybody. I got films as a chairman of the board of Europe and a meeting in Switzerland with us. You name it. I was there. Tata in India. I went everywhere. So then let's dive into the birth of the three EV. Because in part one of your story, you talked about how you got to ride an early EV car. You were familiar with Dr. Curry, who designed the EV1, things like that. And you didn't think there was a future in that. And obviously, there were issues even with the electric bikes, as you mentioned in the first part of the story. So now you've turned your attention to the EV world. Because lithium-ion batteries had come to the forefront. Up to then, the batteries were nickel metal hydride or lead acid. That's what the difference was. And I saw it coming, even though I thought hybrids is the only thing that made sense with the lack of charging stations and the lack of five-minute charges. The only one that agreed with me and stuck to his guns as long as he could was Toyota. So I played with fuel cells. I played with everything with Jeff Polson Laboratory, trying to find what it was, and then came down real simple. If I could give them gorgeous at a great price, I win. That's the only thing everybody was not doing. And that's how the three-wheeler got there when I got desperate and said, how much weight do you save if you take one wheel off? I expected a couple hundred pounds. It's 1,500 pounds with all the things that adjust to that one wheel. And that was half the kilowatts. So let's expand upon that for a second to get a little technical. So eliminating a wheel saved 1,500 pounds. How much does the vehicle weigh in total? Our vehicle, when it's in production, because remember things were made by hand and I put in pieces of steel that won't be there, et cetera, et cetera. Our car will weigh about 2,200 pounds. The average car weighs with that battery about 3,600 pounds. Malcolm, what I'm wondering about, you got three wheels, 2,200 pounds. That is a lightweight car. Now, I live in Texas. I live in the land of, you know, big trucks and scary drivers. I think about a 2,200 pound three wheel car going toe to toe with a big F-350. And I think, where's the safety in that? Number one is the size of a regular car. It also is the widest you can make a car 80 inches wide. 
So I have a wide front end. I got 800 pounds of batteries on the floor. It is the safest car you will ever drive. It handles unbelievable. It does not bend in a curve. It stays flat. It's unreal. So we made it, and we did not have that big-ass wheel in the back sticking up like they do in a three-wheel car. I mean, it's it's like they design the front end, and then they give you a wheel. Yeah, like a Polaris slingshot. We have to tell people it's a three-wheel car. But the truth is, nobody gives a damn. They just see something that is extremely exciting, that is way out of their price range, that is not way out of their price range. And that is such a phenomenal piece of information that the people who look at this car who start off with it just beautiful when they want to know about it because they can't possibly own it. And then when they guess a price and the average is 115,000 guests and we tell somebody it's $29,000, it's like, how fast can I get money out of my pocket to make sure I get a reservation? I want one. This is not a car you need. This is a car you'll want. It's a 2,200 pound. What's the body? Fiberglass? Right now it is, but it's going to be hemp. You're building it out of hemp. No kidding. Well, it's 10 times stronger than steel and it's light as hell. And I can get three growth harvests a year. Yeah, you're taking the Ford approach. They played with it. And of course, Henry played with it for sure. But it's gotten a lot better since then. Is the chassis, the frame, everything is hemp or just the body? No, 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 no. We first are starting from building everything I can to make it the safest car in the world. Now, I heard a rumor, don't know how true this is, so correct me if I'm wrong. You've got some sort of fancy seatbelt situation going on in that car. Once upon a time, I owned the Phoenix International Raceway. It was on wide motor sports twice a year. So the Andretti's and the answers, those are the people who raced in the Speedway. And I got to know a whole bunch about racing. And I saw that harness belts are what kept a lot of people safe in incredible kinds of accidents. So I wanted to put harness belts in. I wanted to do that in the original Brooklyn 50 years ago. But I couldn't because the law says you put the strap in that you see in every car. That's the way it is. That's what you put in. I couldn't put in the harness belt, even though it's better. You put it in that way or go change the law. Well, I got a three-wheel car, so I can put whatever I want in there. So I started with the harness belt. I'm putting in the harness belt. Why? I got kids and grandkids. I'm going to drive the car. That's why. I'm with Sandy Monroe. And I'm talking about the car and talking about him getting involved in that. And he said, oh, you can't use the harness belt. And I'm ready to give him an argument why I'm going to use it. And he says, uh, I designed the belt for the airlines. Really? And he brings out the belt. And all it is is a belt, a regular seat belt that you'll see on airlines now in the newer airplanes. I've already been on the airplanes and seen them. One side is about an inch thick. And when the airbag goes out that's in that seat belt, it goes up and down. So it's a full body airbag. How cool is that? No in your face from the steering wheel. This is perfect. That's what I'm going to use. But if I put one more wheel on that car, I can't use it. And why is that? Because this is a three-wheel car. It's called a motorcycle or an autocycle. So you don't have to meet very many rules. You have a seatbelt on a a motorcycle. Ah, I get it. I'm curious, who is this car targeted for? Who's the audience of a two-seater with scissor doors and three wheels? Everybody. Anybody who wants to own cool for a really great price is our customer. A Lamborghini guy was right next to me at a light. He started yelling at me, so I pushed the button and the window go down and said, can I help you? Yeah, oh my God, that's gorgeous, what is it? And then we turned the light on in the back because the name changes colors on the back. And uh, we said, and I said, so what do you think it should sell for? Oh, I don't know, 300,000? Oh uh, yeah, what would you say for 29,000? I want 10 of them right now. This is a beautiful car. My judgment on if it's beautiful is if I keep on wanting to look at it, and I sure as hell do. It is always outstanding. The interior is beyond belief. It makes you feel rich, and there's stuff in there you've never seen before in any interior. That being said, it drives unbelievable. It takes corner without leaning. It's just amazing, and it's faster than hell. So all that put together is something that 90% of the people cannot afford what that represents. That's an expensive car that you got to be rich to own, except you don't. And that difference gets everybody who sees it, whether they're interested in another car, whether they can afford another car, they don't give a damn if it's electric, they don't give a damn if it's three wheels, they want that car. That's all. And that's what we built it for.
I'm intrigued. There's definitely precedent for a three-wheel car. Forget three-wheel. It's not a three-wheel car. It's a gorgeous car that's out of everybody's price range, except it's not. That's all it is. Forget about everything else about it. How it got there is not important. Nobody gives a damn. This is a Brooklyn vehicle. It doesn't look like, it doesn't smell like, it doesn't feel like. This is an exotic car. This is the car of your dreams that you can now afford. Holy moly. That's it. One thing I'm curious about, and this might be a dumb question, the rear tire on the EV3, how do you change that thing? It's a bitch. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so is it like a motorcycle where you've got two pieces of frame? It's worse than that. No, no, let me give you worse than that. I got two front tires that are a different size than the back tire. So if I needed to put in a spare tire, I'd have to put in two spare tires. So I'm not putting in a spare tire. And what I'm doing is looking around to find anybody who's building a tire that never gets flat. Not that 50 mile top. I never get flat tire. Because if they don't have it, I'm going to sponsor. I don't ever want to fix the tire. What about using a run flat? Is that what you've got on there? You're going to use a run flat? No, no, no. But I want better than just a run flat. I want a tire that never gets flat. Yeah, I think he's talking about like those solid core tires like they use on agricultural equipment. Solid, yeah. That, number one. Number two, I want to electrify the doors because they're a pain in the ass for, I think, a lot of people to pick up and lower. I enjoy them, but I don't think there will be a lot of people that will have the same joy that I have in there. And then I need to soundproof the car because what we do is we hear the tire noise yeah. that goes through the two holes where the big hinges that anchor the door. So it's just too noisy for me. That's your prototype car. Your production car will be a lot quieter, I'm sure. No, 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 not a lot quieter. It's going to be. <laughs> As he mouths that the good. quietest. Yeah, <laughs> that good. What's the range on this? It weighs 2,200 pounds. It weighs nothing. You have a full-size battery going on in there. The range must be pretty serious. 60 kilowatts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It gets 350. 350. Out of 16 kilowatt hours, that's really, really good because that's about a half a that's about a half a gallon of gas equivalent. And as an example, my wife's Pacifica hybrid, it only gets 36 miles or so on a full charge. Wow. Something's wrong. It's a 5,000 pound van. Oh, right? oh, that's what's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Malcolm, your battery, what does that compare to? I, I mean, is that like a Tesla-sized battery? Is it smaller? Is it, what are we talking about here? It's bigger than Tesla. Because bigger. everybody is not as advanced as Tesla is. And it's actually LG. Oh, no kidding. Well, wait, wait. wait. There's a but. But the wait, but there's more. Is we are now talking to various people about building our car. Because I do not want to build our car. And whoever we use will have their own platform. Whether it's Foxconn or anybody else of the 14 different companies we found around the world, including in the United States, that will build cars for other people, electric cars we're talking about. Magna, I mean, to name some of the big names in the game. They all have skateboards. So whoever manufactures it, we have to re-engineer to match the skateboard that they got, which is not going to be a big deal, but it is something that has to be done. And whatever battery we're using now will probably not be the same battery, which I don't care. But I have looked at, as everybody who's in the electric vehicle business has, and they know there are two glaring facts that cannot be ignored. Numero uno, there is not enough electricity to handle all these cars charging, no matter what anybody says. And they can't get more electricity as fast as you need. There are no five-minute charges, which makes this an adventure every goddamn time you want to charge the car. There's not enough charging stations by 2 million. Forget mm. about your garage. If you got a garage, you can buy the car. As long as you're not planning on going big trips. And why? You may have enough miles to go to a big trip, but at the end of that trip, you're talking about four or five hours for 99% of the chargers that are already out there. So you got to go go to sleep someplace. You got to go eat someplace to get the damn car charged so you can go back. Oh, that really turns me on big time. I got to experience it. I'm in a rental home. They got 220 in the house, but not the one that fits the plug for the charger. So that meant I'm out there testing the car. I got to go charge it and have my wife pick me up for shit in the car for a couple hours. What a wonderful way to hate your car. I <laughs> hated my car. I was ready to trash it until I got somebody to come over and got permission from the owner to put 220 outlet that fits my thing on the outside of the garage. And every time I come home, I just plug it in. That's the only way to own an electric car. What a stupid thing that is. 
And when you have the millions of cars coming from the half a trillion dollars that have been invested by all the car companies producing 300 different models, you are going to find a lot of people hate their car after they own it for the first week and realize that they're consumed by where the hell you charge this car 24 hours a day. So why aren't we making a shift then in the paradigm here to push EVs towards delivery, transit, mass transit, vehicles that currently now are either diesel or gas that just sit idling all day long rather than foisting this upon the consumer market that needs to get around with basically unlimited range. That would have been very smart. You said would have been past tense. (laughs) Well, it's way too late. Everybody's going down that road. They're going off the cliff no matter what. Nobody's going to stop them. Except I refuse to accept that I am going into a stupid situation. I'll sell all my cars. I ain't got no problem with that. But this is a dumb industry, the way it's all going. And people are going to fail big time. There's nothing to stop them. They're throwing away combustion cars and all those assets and all those sales. So the way I am, I can't stand for things that don't make sense. So I start anytime somebody called me up with any technology that would either make a five minute charge or something else that could make sense. I went and looked at it and never found what I was looking for until I did. So do you see the market coming back full circle? Like will ice power plants make a resurgence? With what I have, every car company in the world will continue making the cars they're making now. It will cost them a little less, but they will have something that takes three minutes to fill up your tank. The tank will go about 3,000 miles before it needs to have another three-minute refill. And our dealers can go to their house or their business and fill them up anytime they want for a $10 subscription. It sounds like you're not on board with the electrification of cars. I'm not on board with that. It's ready for all the amount of vehicles that they're going right. to pour into the market. That's what I'm not on the board for. Now, that being said, Toyota... He's the only one right. Yeah, Toyota and BMW, they're going hydrogen. They like that idea. Have you thought about doing that with the EV3? Their hydrogen is primitive. It's all going through fuel cells. Did you think about this for the EV3? We will build a four-wheel car that will look very similar to our three-wheel car, and it will run on something that nobody ever imagined. It already does. It's not a matter of conversation. It's a matter of it works. Okay. And it's readily available, and is nothing could be cleaner in the universe. So let's shift gears. What I've been curious about, and you mentioned it just briefly, is the dealership network. How is that working out? Who is going to sell these cars? Uh, Let's say this. I want to buy one of your cars. Where do I go? How do I do this? What do I do? First of all, my history, whether it be Subaru, Pinafrina, Bertone, Yugo, whatever it is, Modus Operandi was set up a distributor, case of Subaru, 14 of them, buy stock in the company, they therefore give cash. They set up dealers, the dealers buy stock in the company. So everybody has a reason to be successful besides just selling the car. And in every single situation, they all made money on that. So I set up the dealers and I set up the distributors and it always worked. And I have thousands of people who the fathers I did business with are retired, but the kids are still working and the kids all know the name. And the car is something that they know they'll sell every single one they can get. And they know they can bring in traffic and sell all the other stuff they got. And we encourage that kind of thing. As soon as we decide on who's going to manufacture it, Then we will sign up our 10 distributors and they will sign up 50 dealers each in their areas. Now, why do the dealers do the things that I want them to do? Because we treat them one with respect because we really respect them. We really know you need service. We really know you need people. No matter how much you can sell on the internet, it gets to a point people would like to touch the car before they buy it. They would like to drive the car before they buy it. And they would like to know they're going to get service tomorrow if it breaks down tomorrow. Not two months from now, they'll get an appointment. So all these people selling on the internet, have a good time. Wait till the numbers get big and they find about what people do when they love a car and they can't get it serviced. They start hating and they go with venom. And the more they like the car, the more venom they come when they can't have it. And that's going to start happening to Mr. Musk, who has the money and the brains to figure it out, but he better figure it out. So what are your thoughts on the future of Tesla. Do you think they will be absorbed into one of the other larger companies later on? Or do you see them being around perpetually? Tesla is a success because of Musk. 
The rest of the companies are not a success because they don't have a Mr. Musk. <laughs> they have all the people over here in that building that come from combustion engines. And they're having to tell people who have a whole different outlook on the world and the technology, they're not in charge. These people over here are in charge. And these people over here are used to taking forever to make decisions so they don't make the wrong decision. Well, you're going into a market where everybody's moving too fast down the road and they're just like a bunch of sheep going off the other end. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Nothing about it works. If EVs work, all the guys that are sitting in the offices get fired. And if it doesn't work, everybody gets fired. What a great position to be in. I'll make you a bet. That Mary Barra and everybody else who is CEOs of these car companies, sometimes around 2030, take retirement right before the shit really hits the fan. Watch. It's not like we know it and nobody knows it. Everybody knows everything I'm saying. So there's an argument to be made about the majors, the Toyotas and the Volkswagens and the Fords of the world. They know how to build quality cars. They've been building them for 100 no, no. plus years. Combustion cars. They know how to build combustion cars. Let's delete the powertrain from the equation altogether. It's not they... the powertrain. It's everything. In electric, it's only the powertrain. Right. But do you see a future where Tesla says, I stop building a car, this object, and sell the drivetrains to the Toyotas and the Fords and the VWs of the world. And now it's a marriage of the two, right? The fast moving technology with people that know how to build quality vehicles. I'm telling you, the people who build cars come from combustion. It's a different game in electric. It's a whole different game in electric. And the electric is moving from whatever the hell they invested in today. Two years from then, they're going to have to start changing because it's going to be a better technology. And then they're going to be, oh, I don't know. I got too much invested over here. And then, oh, my God, where do you see what's going to happen with that nonsense? All right. I'm telling you, it's upside down. But with what I have found, they will be able to keep their factories open. They will be able to keep building the cars they're building, and it will actually cost them a little less. And those cars will be cleaner than the electric. So they'll have both to sell. Electric over here, and this over here, that's a three-minute fill your tank whenever they want. So do you see the R&D that Porsche is doing as a threat to that with their synthetic fuels that they've been working on to keep ICE cars on the road? All the crap they're working on are kindergarten compared to what we got. I promise you. I promise you it's something that nobody ever heard of before. But yet it's everything everybody knows about. It's crazy. At first, they were scared to show the world at all. So they decided to use it, and they're using it now to build a utility running on it. And we're going to be using it for vehicles in the United States. I can see Eric is thinking about, where is he going with this? What's he going to make it power by? Malcolm, who's going to build the... You're looking for somebody to build the car. It'll be built here in America? We're talking to two people that I can't disclose yet. In Michigan. Will it be built in America, Canada, yes. Mexico? In America. I read somewhere or heard somewhere you're looking to make sure that it's a veteran workforce. Is that true or is that falling in the wayside? It will be heavily veteran. Yes. Okay. And we have people who like Tom Ridge, who was Secretary of Homeland Security, happens to be president of the Wounded Veterans of America. Paul Buca was a Medal of Honor winner and he was military advisor for Bush and Obama. Ken Fisher, the Fisher Houses. All those guys are involved in our company and they are involved because they like the fact that we like to have veterans be building our cars as much as we can get. Why? Because these people are dedicated. When they do something they love and get paid really well, you got people who are going to build it with love instead of just going to work. And that's what I want. Who is helping you on the backside? Engineering, R&D, et cetera. Is that all coming from the mind of Malcolm? No, oh, no, no. Forget me. I don't know anything about cars. I know everything about the car industry. But when it comes okay. to technical, I listen, but I have people who are better than me that make decisions on it for me. We have found a way to get the benefit of other people's work. Like, for instance, do you know how many engineers that are hired to do the platform to get the batteries and the motors and everything else in the car connected? We don't have one of them. We buy the whole thing and go boom. So history sometimes tends to repeat itself. And you find yourself again crossing paths with the name DeLorean. Any thoughts on the new car? Oh, absolutely. First of all, John and I were old friends. Before died. John was going to be my president. I think I told you that story. His daughter called me up and said, the dad told me before he died that I ought to meet with you. He did him lots of favors. I said, absolutely be happy to. We came out, we had lunch. 
and now we communicate and she's really after knowing everything about daddy and building a car or doing something for him. Whatever it is, she's out there to do it for John, her daddy. Obviously, you've seen the new design. What do you think of the DMG? Uh, I don't know that that's her. There's two other people that are building cars that both say they have DeLorean's rights. And I asked her about that, and she mumbled something. I think she just doesn't want to deal with the facts. But somebody has bought it, and somebody thinks they own it. God bless them. The one I saw, I thought was beautiful. Do you think Kat's going to be able to build the car? Who cares? It's a $175,000 car, so a few DeLorean people will buy it. God bless them. I think there's still room for more supercars in this world. I'm all in favor of something else to look at on the road, you know? Oh, I agree. I agree. And it would be nice if everybody started making a pretty car anyhow. But it's not their sales pitch. <laughs> Too bad. Now we've gotten to the point where only one design cheats the wind. You just put a different badge on the front of it, right? So I, yeah. I don't get it. They're still going to have the same problem. You got to charge that car every single day. It's a different kind of animal. All of a sudden, that animal becomes part of your life. And I don't want my car to be part of my life. I'm buying it, but they're not intruding. And that car does. In your car, the EV3, you don't have to charge it every single day. I do charge it every single day. I would not dare not charge it. When it pulls into my house, a charger goes into the damn thing. When yours is in production, isn't that what you were saying? It's going to be powered by something very, very different that you won't have to charge? Oh, no, 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 no. The EV3 is an electric car. When we do the next thing, it'll be a four-wheel car. The four-wheel car, okay. Same look, same body. That I learned, but it's a four-wheel car. It'll be four seats, not two seats. It'll have all-wheel drive. We've talked about the three EV. We've talked about, let's call it the, the four EV or the four-wheel Bricklin that will be coming out after that. But the bigger question is, at 84 years young, what's next for Malcolm Bricklin? You're a forward-thinking guy. You never stop moving. What's next? The stuff I'm talking about is next. The stuff I'm talking about will change the world as we know it. We will be able to clean up the world without being abusive, without making stupid rules, without pushing everybody down an industry that doesn't make a lot of sense yet. And it can be used everywhere for everything. And it's 100% clean. And it doesn't need any special anything but a pump. So I can deliver it to your house with a pump on the back of a truck and a subscription agreement without a problem. Picture hydrogen that comes from water and put into a turbine and out comes something that you would call hydrogen, but doesn't have two cells, it has one, and it's not on anybody's chart. They call it a hydrogen, but it's apparently something new. And here's why it's new. It's combustible in a combustion engine, but it's not volatile. It doesn't go boom. In fact, if you pour it on the ground, you throw a match in, it doesn't light. And it is supposed to get between 100 and 150 miles per gallon which will cost retail about 7 or $8. So liquid hydrogen at room temperature that can go into every gas pump, every gas station, put in one pump, and can have it at the dealers. And you can take your combustion car and convert it. So the 289 million used cars out there, my dealers can start converting to hydrogen. I like the chemical properties of that because it's as safe as diesel in that same respect. It's not volatile. You could throw a match at diesel, it won't light, but only under compression does it combust. So this is really cool as an alternative fuel. And you can pour it on yourself and you can stick your hand in it, which I have, and you feel the energy. You feel it. It's amazing. Truly amazing. And all that comes out, of course, is paper. And I promise you, when you see the four-wheeler and you see what it's all about, it'll be the first car on your list you're going to want to have. That's a car I want to have. That's a car that you brag about the fuel. It doesn't control you. And that's the most important part of this whole damn thing. That's what I was looking for. And I found it. And I couldn't imagine. I, I never thought that that's what I would find. Because I played with hydrogen for two years with Trepa Postal Laboratory. And I mixed it. Because the gas goes boom. And the fluid and the liquid has to be stored at minus 450 degrees. Not too cool, either one, mm -hmm. in my opinion. So when I heard this was hydrogen, I almost didn't want to go see it. Hmm. So there again, sometimes when you think you know too much, you can lose an opportunity because this was something just totally different. It's not on anybody's charts. And everybody else that's playing with hydrogen is playing in kindergarten. The one thing I wondered, carrying back from part one, is would this be an opportune time to bring back the Brooklyn Turner engine? Yes, I am. Wow. Well done. You're going to build two of those prototypes. One will use the Brooklyn Turner hand-built engine. I'm trying to find the relatives of Frank so that they benefit from what I'm about to do. 
but it's a bitch because there's a million Turners in Texas. The law firm we hired had three Turners in it. None of them were related. <laughs> Anyhow, hydrogen runs on simple engines. You have to take off the catalytic the converter. You got to take off all the other controls. So it's actually cheaper to build using the same combustion engine that you got right now. And by giving them the rights and putting up enough hydrogen places and letting them know that the dealers can have this subscription agreement and deliver it to Anybody who buys a car from them, their place of business or whatever, you know, they can do a hundred a day at three minutes and they got three hours of travel. What a cool thing. Best way to have fuel is not to ever think about it. Malcolm, with 60 plus years in the automotive industry, as an entrepreneur, as a businessman, with all sorts of different listeners tuned into this right now, what kind of advice can you give aspiring entrepreneurs or people that want to get into this industry or maybe follow in your footsteps, some lessons learned that you can pass on for the younger generations? I think the best lesson learned is what a man by the name of Elon Musk did. He and Eberhardt asked to see me 13, 14 years ago. So I spent four hours with him. I they were just asking for advice, which Musk actually didn't want to hear. He was building a car. He was not going to have a dealer network. He was going to do it like Apple. I tried to explain Apple. is a cell phone and a car is not exactly a cell phone. That son of a gun came out and did the most remarkable job any human being could do in the world. And while he was doing that, he was sending rockets up and he was putting things in people's brains and he's boring holes underneath the ground. The man's a damn genius and he's a stubborn genius. And it was his stubbornness and his ability to never give up that got that company to be as successful as it is. And that's a lack of somebody like that that is making mincemeat of everybody else who's trying to get into business because he makes decisions in the world out there the goal is never make a decision. Don't get blamed for anything. I mean, it's a goddamn joke. That's all. So the moral to the story is... Follow what I'm on. He wanted to do it and he did it. That's the only thing. If you want to do something, do it. I said, that's all there is to it, kid. But only do what you really think you love doing. You put those three, love it, do it. Throughout his career, Malcolm Brickland has been known for his unconventional ideas and his willingness to take risks. While his ventures have not always been successful, he has remained a respected figure in the automotive industry and a symbol of American entrepreneurship. He has also been the subject of numerous books, documentaries, and articles chronicling his many successes and setbacks in the business world. If you'd like to learn more about Malcolm and keep up with all the progress over at Visionary Vehicles, be sure to log on to www.vvcars.com or follow him on social via LinkedIn or Facebook. That's it. Malcolm, I would like to be able to get you back on the show and get you back on the phone and talk more about progress on the company, how it's coming along. Is that possible? Of course it is. Of course it is. And I promise as soon as I'm able to talk, really talk about it, I can't wait. Have a great day. I've enjoyed it. You too. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thanks, Malcolm. Take care. Bye. If you like what you've heard and want to learn more about GTM, be sure to check us out on www.gtmotorsports.org. You can also find us on Instagram at Grand Touring Motorsports. Also, if you want to get involved or have suggestions for future shows, you can call or text us at 202-630-1770 or send us an email at crewchief at gtmotorsports.org. We'd love to hear from you. Hey, everybody. Crew Chief Eric here. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Break Fix, and we wanted to remind you that GTM remains a no annual fees organization, and our goal is to continue to bring you quality episodes like this one at no charge. As a loyal listener, please consider subscribing to our Patreon for bonus and behind-the-scenes content, extra goodies, and GTM swag. For as little as $2.50 a month, you can keep our developers, writers, editors, casters, and other volunteers fed on their strict diet of Fig Newtons, Gummy Bears, and Monster. Consider signing up for Patreon today at www.patreon.com forward slash GT Motorsports. And remember, without fans, supporters, and members like you, none of this would be possible.